So Pete, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And why don't you just give just even a brief intro for yourself? And obviously I've done one already, but what, uh, what would you like people to know about your experience? Yeah. So I'm failing in retirement for the second time. You, they, uh, I spent 33 years with the Chicago Fire Department. I left there in 2013 for purely personal reasons. I was pretty much maxed out on my promotional opportunities, pension, all that kind of stuff. And then I, I was strangely enough offered a job in the suburb of Chicago and I wound up being fire chief out there for five and a half years or so. And then last April I retired from there. Now I'm, you know, failing at retirement by teaching a fair amount. The, I, I guess the, the relevant part of the background is I got involved with underwriters laboratories and their firefighter safety research Institute as it was being formed back in 2006, 2007, thereabouts. And so I spend my time now communicating that information to the fire service in one way. And so it would be safe to say after 30 plus years in the fire service, you're no amateur when it comes to dealing with emergencies and crisis and leading people through some pretty interesting experiences, I could only assume. So those are some of the things that we're going to really unpack today from a leadership perspective. So Pete, does anything come to mind with regard to a particular story or experience that you've had that really crystallizes what it takes to lead in general, but also during crisis? I'm going to, I'm going to try this one. We'll see how it goes. Cause I'm not a very good at telling fire stories. I just, okay. Until somebody else starts, I can't, I have a hard time coming up with it or recalling it myself. But so I have this recollection and I, I like to say when I'm presenting in a class, I say, you've heard about the book, everything I uh, need to know. I learned in kindergarten, everything I needed to know about the fire service. I learned from my first officer, Tommy Barrett. And it's true in a lot of ways. Tommy was just one of those natural leader guys, very quiet, very unassuming, very soft-spoken, but lesson after lesson after lesson, a lot of which didn't really go on me until years later. It's like how your dad gets smart after you're 21. Tommy got really smart once I became a lieutenant myself. But the one that sticks in my mind the most, I couldn't have had more than eight, it was certainly less than a year in a job, somewhere around eight months. And I was blessed that Tommy never said, do this. Cause I said, so Tommy always wanted to know why did I do what I did? So what we had this incident, Tommy, just a routine, well, I, I, but I could tell this one was a little different. He was on edge and he said, why did you do that? And I said, let's call him John. And he said, John told me to do it. And he says, well, why would you do what John said? I said, John's got 20 years on the job. And he pulls me aside a little longer because we're still on the scene. And he says, listen, repeat, there are guys with. 20 years on the job and there are guys with one year repeated 20 times and John falls into the second category, right? And huge lesson, right? Is that time on the job doesn't equal experience and an experience doesn't equal knowledge and understanding, right? And, and that those two things, right, are, are important, right? And that you always have to be, you know, questioned. And we live in this, not in the fire service, it's a authority driven job and it and it needs to be, but even with that, you need to be responsible for your own decisions, no matter where you are in the pecking order. And that was just a huge lesson that I find myself having to relearn again and again and again for a week. So when you have people like quote unquote, John, so the same year repeated 20 times, what's the difference between a, a John and say a, a Tom for that matter, if you were to look at those two, because I think that we have that in all of our lives where we've got somebody where they've got so many years and they just get an automatic pass in a lot of cases. It's wow. They've got a lot of years in, but to your point, that's a really good point where years of experience, it's, it's completely different. So what is the difference between a, a John and a Tom in, in your experience? Tom knows that he can never know enough Tom, in, in a very intuitive way. It's a cl cliche in the fire service. You never stop learning on this job. You hear people say that all the time. And usually what they mean is you never stop learning from. But Tom understood that you just can't know enough, that you're always ignorant and that because so many things touch our job, right? So many things are unknowable that it's just not possible. So 
if you're, if you stay very conscious of the fact that you don't know enough and you need to be absorbing information all the time, then you really aren't always learning. But, but once you get comfortable, once you get, you know, that feeling that I know what I'm doing and I can handle this and I got it down, then you're either becoming dangerous or irrelevant in some cases. You might do your one little narrow aspect of the job really well, but the fire service needs generalists and needs specialists. And so you don't serve your community very well when you become that specialist or your fire department or your fellow. Fire. Yeah. And I think that we're seeing that in the private sector as well, where the breadth of problems and issues and challenges are so great that to your point, the second that you think I've got this one dialed in, that's exactly when you're going to get a left field during a meeting or something. So what are people looking for from your perspective in their leader? So I heard you talk about a lifelong learner, but it's also maybe being humble would be one of those things. What else are people looking for in their leader during all times? I think that they're... The two words always come back to me whenever we're having these discussions, and, and one is trust. As simple and it, uh, you know, that as that can sound, is that people follow those people that they can trust. And however you want to find that or shape that, you know, can vary a lot during different circumstances and environments. But fundamentally, will I trust this person to take care of me? Uh, they're not going to follow you if they don't trust you. you know? and, and the second word that comes back again and again is honor. And there's a lot of ways to talk about integrity and truth and honesty and all those sorts of things. But when you think about it, honor encapsulates the law, right? Can you look at yourself and say, am I doing the honorable thing? And if you can't, then your ability to lead groups are, because they're, they're whether they can articulate it or not, they're going to respond to that. Is this an honorable person? Is this somebody who I can, and, and the honor ties into trust. You can't have one without the other. They feed on each other. So that's a really good point because trust is ultimately where we're trying to get to. So in your experience, how would you establish trust with the people that you work with, for example? Is it a one grandiose declaration or is it more an accumulation of things? Some people are really good at that. They're those what would you call it? The, the, the leaders that personify leadership, the, the, they're overtly good leaders. And, and I think they can get away with that sort of bombastic sort of follow me, lead from the front, that sort of thing. And if you're, if you have that personality, God bless you. But that's not, most of us fail every single day. And when we're talking to new lieutenants and new officers, and we talk about these leadership things, you've got to accept that you're going to fail every single day. And then the, the key is to come back and, and try again. So the, that person who is clearly making the effort to take care of their subordinates every single day, and, and it's not just going through the motion, but clearly means it. when someone says, and Brunin Sini, who was just a genius at this kind of stuff. So if you were to ask somebody, how are you feeling? Whether they say, fine. And Alan would say, the follow-up question is, tell me about now you've established that you really do care, right? It's not just this normative sort of exchange we go through in, in social discourse. It's, oh, tell me about fighting. Now you really do care, right? Now, I know, I really, I want to hear how, how are you doing? Tell me about that. All right. Yeah. And it was those sorts of things that, that Tommy was really good, at, right? That, that he really did care. That you understood what you're doing and why. It wasn't just with emotions. And would it be safe to say that, well, first of all, your team members need to know. So what I'm hearing you say is they need to know that you care first and foremost, and that's a genuine care, not just a perfunctuary. Hey, that's cool. How was your night? Oh, it's good, sir. Yeah, that's great. Let's move on and start doing stuff. How, so you talked about the follow-up question of tell me about fine. And I think that we're seeing a lot of this in this current environment and during crisis where we, as leaders, we're so busy doing 5 million other things, but really it only takes an extra 30 seconds with each person to ask them, tell me about fine. And is there anything else that, that builds trust in teams? Because I, I agree a hundred percent. 
trust is basic. If you don't have that, you don't have a team. But is there anything else in your experience, Pete, that can really build trust? I think something that that even in, in our lifetimes it has changed is that it's the, the personal contact and I, physical personal contact. Right? We do so much by email and and text and all, which is wonderful. It's a, it's effective in a lot of different ways. It accomplishes a lot of things. But there's always that because of the brevity of those messages, there's way too much room for misinformation or for incomplete thoughts. And so you can solve so many problems and build so many relationships when you get out of your chair and actually go talk to the person that you've got an issue. And you know, where you can look at each other, not just over the phone, that'll do if you have to, but every form of communication is better than email it is the way I like to say, or, or tech, well, electronic. It has its place and it's extraordinarily useful in its way, but when it gets in the way of personal relationships, which in it inevitably does, then you have that break you can't build trust. You can't build confidence. You can't have that stuff if they can't see you and hear you and respond immediately to each other, all that stuff that only personal contact allows you. And would you agree that there's something almost like energetic with regard to being in the presence of another person that you can actually sense whether they're being genuine and whether you can trust them even without being overt about it. Cause I, I don't think any of us walk into a room and say, hmm, I wonder if I could trust this person. Would it be safe to say that that's something that you can almost feel or not feel through those interactions? In, in the body language sort of stuff, you're seeing me from the shoulders up. There's all kinds of fidgeting or whatever going on down here that you don't see, even when you're doing face to face over a video, doing it online and all that. And so the body language is, is a big part of it, but there's also just those, those little gestures, the handshake, the touch, the, all those sorts of things that, that we use subconsciously to decide, is this a genuine person or not? And you lose that when you don't have the person's benefit. So You've got to find a way to incorporate that into your interaction with your employees, especially your subordinates. Yeah. And again, that just goes to show that you care and actually be present and care when you're talking to them. And what about, let's flip it now to honor, because that means different things to different people. And it's uh, almost a throwback to the old days where we lived with honor. What, when you said that, what exactly? It's not a term you hear used very much, but when you think about it, to, to me, it encapsulates all those other similar terms. Like you, you have to be honest, you have to be forthright, right? You have to be trustworthy, all these things. If you had a, if I had to find one word for all those things, it, it would be I. So it's fundamentally, it, it's two things. One, can I look myself in the mirror and live with this? decision or, or what I said. And the second part of it, as silly as it may sound is, could I look my mother in the eye and say what I just said and get away with it? And even the United States Marine Corps uses that example in terms of hazing things and, and stuff like that. So would you do this in front of your mother? If not, it's an and I find that so true in so many of our professional relationships. If my mom was sitting here, would I be treating this person the way I'm treating them right now? And, if, and a lot of times the answer yeah. is no. Yeah. Or I'm not sure. Or yeah, but. As soon as you say, yeah, but, well, you know what? You're wrong. You're wrong. Because. Yeah. Yeah. That's what our parents, and we often say our mother, but our, our parents held us to those kind of standards. Right? So would it be safe to say then, because an area we don't talk a lot about our values. And in my experience, you're looking for leaders that really align with your values and would values fall into honor as well? It's yeah, absolutely. And, and this is where I think our discussions about leadership often break down because we're reticent to talk about things like values because we confuse them with morals and, and things mm -hmm. like that. No, this is, if you can't and again, and I got to be careful about this because I, I was never in the, the military at all, but I, and I refer to these Marine Corps lessons a lot because a lot of my peers and a lot of my mentors were in the service and the Marine Corps in particular. And so I've drawn a lot of lessons from those sorts of things, but if you can't 
Well, let's make sure you thought. Just the Marine Corps and values. Yeah. It, oh, that, that, you know, they, they like to say that we put the cult in culture. They're not afraid to express who and what. And you can agree or disagree or whatever, but this is who we are. And, and if a, as a company, as a fire service, as a fire department, or as in, in this case, as a private company, if, if you can't articulate your company's values, you're in serious trouble. You, you really are. And there has to be a means of doing that. And, and if you're trying to lead and motivate and do these other things, and you haven't clearly articulated what those values are, you, you're going to find yourself not getting very far. You're going to be very far. And I think in, I don't want to speak for you, but in, in my own experience, so many conflicts come down to conflicting values and often we don't use values as a means to bring people together. There's more that connects us than disconnects us. And for, if a team has different values or team members have different values, that's often where you're going to see some conflict. Is that any thoughts on that? We've gone through this in the fire service during the course of my career, where we became a uh, slightly less white male dominated organization. We've had to introduce di different different cultures, different races, uh, different genders, the, the whole thing. It's been a very real part of the fire service during the last 30 years or so. And we often find ourselves talking about respecting our differences. Well, okay, that's all fine and good, but what's really going to bring us together is when we understand where our commonalities lie. And, and that's where, you know, because we get so caught up in your values might be different than mine. You're not going to find any teamwork or any, you know, getting together around that. That work on what, what do we all share as human beings? What's common amongst all ourselves, right? And, and those things are, first off, much easier to identify. And then what's easier to rally around. And, and finally, it's all you've got is your innate commonalities, right? And if you're not focused on those things, you're ultimately, it doesn't mean you don't respect those other things, but the, the focus has to become, the unity comes when you're focused on your commonalities. What, what do we all share? And that takes you back to the discussion about the a corporations or a group's values, right? You have to build those values and articulate those values around what everybody understands to be good and right and true. And, and we're going to revisit that when we talk about decision-making here shortly, but I want to switch gears a little bit. And so Pete, 33 years ago, or let's say you were, when you first became an officer, maybe you got a stripe or something like that. What was, what was Pete back then thinking as a new leader? relative to what Pete has, is thinking now, yeah. some years later. And I, I get, we only have a certain amount of time. So when Pete got his first in, in, in the United States, most of the fire service, we, we uh, get bugles, right? Uh, trumpets. <laughs> and uh, so I got my first bugle and, uh, or first stripe. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to get these guys that are twice my age to listen to what I have to say to them? Because I was, I was maybe 27 years old when I became a lieutenant, which at the time was very young in, in a department of my size. So that was the big challenge. How do I get these guys respect? And, and you're always hyper aware of that whole thing. And then what you find is that you typically try to get their respect by doing what they want to do, like letting them have their way. And that's a big mistake, right? So you learn those hard lessons about, because yeah. And so the, the guy 30 some years later wants to say with, to all those new lieutenants is, don't make my mistakes. We, we all go through that. But the, I think the big lesson for me and the big difference was, is that you have, you have to show respect to get respect. Well, and that's a very easy thing to articulate, but it can be an extraordinarily difficult thing to accomplish because you don't know necessarily what that individual, how they feel respected. You have to learn what makes them feel respected. And, and it's hard work. This was one of the very, very late lessons I learned about leadership is that it's hard work. And that's why good leaders are so rare is because they're not willing to put in the effort. It really is like any other skill that requires an extraordinarily amount, an extraordinary amount of effort to get good at it. And if you're looking for some 
magic sort of formula or a motivational speech or whatnot. No, it's about grinding effort. It's hard. Mm -hmm. And trial and error and being deliberate, fine tuning, that doesn't work. Try this kind of thing. Would you agree? The only thing that, that I, I learned really late was it doesn't get easier. Don't expect it to get easier. Expect it to get harder. And I, I, I work out every day and I, I, I at a gym and there's a, the, the trainer that's there. And he, uh, he, he's got a t-shirt he often wears. says, burpees hate you too. You know? <laughs> Because <laughs> everybody hates doing burpees, right? And because they don't get any easier, at least not for me. And, and it's become one of my metaphors for leadership. Leadership is burpees. It's hard. It's going to stay hard. It's never going to get easier. Get, suck it up. Get used to it. And the more comfortable you get with that idea, ultimately the easier it does become. Because you realize it's going to be a challenge every day, right?